<laughs> All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started, guys. I'll give you my intro while you're fixing your plates. My name is Julie Aitchison. I'm with Health Diagnostic Laboratory. And uh, some of you may remember uh, once before when I was here, we were talking about hypertension. And today we're talking about men's health. Um, you'll probably see more of the name Health Diagnostic Laboratory as we partner with your company for wellness programs. So I'm happy to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and get started today. I'll give you a little bit more information about who we are, Health Diagnostic Laboratory. We're a clinical laboratory focused on disease state management. We're actually located in Richmond, Virginia. And we offer custom panels of tests beyond the conventional lipid panel, meaning beyond the conventional uh, testing for cholesterol, like your total cholesterol, your LDL, and your HDL, we check for more detail than just that. And probably why your company has decided on us utilizing our service, we look for earlier detection of disease and more targeted treatment by your physician utilizing the results on your lab test. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is prevent heart attacks, strokes, and vascular events. There's just too much of that going on right now in our country. We need to do something about it. OK. What do men want? Correct me if you think this is wrong. More energy, more strength, fitness, and less disease. So we're going to talk about some strategies to achieve those things today. So if this is your idea of how to get more energy, I do want to share some alternate ideas with you. Hopefully you have more in mind than just caffeine. So here's what we're going to focus on today, how to get more energy. Exercise, nutrition, handling stress, and hydration. All right, so our, stress part. <laughs> our number one goal today we're talking about is exercise. That's the first one. So why should we exercise? Lots of good reasons. Weight loss or maintenance. It's not always about just losing weight. Also, putting on muscle is an important part of weight. Appetite control. Maintaining healthy blood pressure, blood cholesterol levels, and blood sugar levels. Also improving circulation, just allowing your body to get more oxygen to the cells throughout the body. Also increased energy. If you find yourself a lot of times saying, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm always tired, I'm always so tired, then uh, you might need to look at your exercise routine. Exercise will give you more energy and then certainly reducing stress. Now then, components of an exercise program, nice little acronym here, FIT, and that stands for frequency, intensity, time, and type. We're gonna go over that, then I've also got a handout on that for you when we're all done. All right, frequency of exercise. Ideally, we should be doing something active every single day. So that would be the ultimate goal right there, six to seven times a week. Now this is, I think, a very important number. Our research tells us that in order to have some health benefits from exercise, you should be exercising at least 150 uh, minutes per week. Be glad I caught my typo error. It did say 150 hours, but I went back and corrected that. So minimum of 150 minutes per week. That's not that bad. That's like three times a week for nearly an hour, 50 minutes, or five days a week for just a half hour. So it's not really a ton, and that should be your minimum. You might not even be there yet, and, and you'll probably hear me say more than once, start wherever you are. I've got some patients, bless their hearts, and they just, they can't hardly do anything, and they can do maybe five minutes. And I say, well, you start right there, and you do five minutes, and you keep doing five minutes until you can do six. So start wherever you are, and then build up from there. 
it would be great also to add at least two days of at least 15 minutes of strength training. And that can be something as much as, you know, going to your gym and using all of the static weight machines, or you might just pull some cans out of your pantry and use those as barbells, or you might have some equipment in your basement. But two days a week of at least 15 minutes of strength training. Now, intensity of exercise, for a lot of good reasons, we generally recommend moderate intensity. And then what does that exactly mean? There's different ways of interpreting that. Is one, one is based on target heart rate, and there are various um, uh, scales and charts you can use. And if you do go to a gym, you know, the exercise equipment nowadays has all kinds of flashing lights to tell you what uh, heart rate you're uh, operating at. So somewhere in the um, 70 to 80 percent range is considered moderate. Um, Borg scales, which this numerical scale here is, is another way of telling exertion. So something between the somewhat hard and the hard range is a pretty good level of exertion and that correlates with your target heart range. Another simple way is just your talk test. You know, you're walking along at a brisk pace, you're walking with your spouse or a friend, and you can carry on a bit of a conversation. You can't sing a song, or you'd be too winded, but you can talk a bit, and that's a good judge of moderate intensity. All righty, so the time of the exercise, in other words, your duration, ideally, minimum of 30 minutes, and again, you, you might not be able to do but 10 or 15 right now, but you can work your way up over time, build up your endurance, and work up to 30 minutes minimum for each time that you exercise. And we're talking primarily about the cardio component here. Again, an ideal level to reach would be 45 minutes plus, say 45 minutes to an hour. One of the reasons that it's real good to reach that point, and it might take you a week to reach that point, might take you a month, might take you a year. But the reason it's so good to reach that point is your body is not only burning um, sugars for energy, but it moves more into burning fats. And you can get some significant cholesterol lowering benefits if you're reaching that time point for your exercise. All righty, type of exercise, using large muscle groups, which is why, you know, when you're biking, you're on the treadmill, you're on the elliptical, you're using your thighs, you're using your legs, and that's really producing that good aerobic cardio effect. And I'll talk to some of my, especially my women patients sometimes, and say, you know, it's not just all about the scale weight, you're going to be putting on muscle. And that's a good thing. In fact, you might start noticing that your jeans get a little tighter in the thighs because you're building up your thigh muscles. And that's a good thing. It should be a continuous activity. So sometimes walking a dog isn't really going to accomplish this. It's still good to do that. Your dog's going to appreciate it and it's good to be active. But you pretty much need to be able to go without stopping to receive the kind of benefits we're talking about here. Examples would be walking, running, cycling, working out on the elliptical machine, swimming, or Zumba. All righty, I found some good information about exercising on the road. Do any of y'all travel for your work? And I, I know your trucking company, obviously. Well, um, some ideas for when you do travel would be using, your, using local gyms that you're you know, a member of, the branch uh, locations. And every hotel pretty much has something in the way of a fitness center nowadays. You can also walk or jog around the rest areas, find a high school track and your local parks. And before you go, go online and find out where the, hawk, the uh, hiking and walking trails are. You might see some real beautiful scenery, you might see some waterfalls. So that's a good way to get in some activity when you're on the road, whether it's work or vacation. I thought this was very interesting. Take advantage of truck stop resources like Stay Fit from uh, TA, that's Travel America. Isn't that's that what that logo. is? Yeah, TA. Okay. That's their logo. Okay, great. And um, Petro, there's a website here, and they can tell you for all of the different states where you can find the truck stops that will have everything from a 
a small workout room to uh, a basketball goal and various things. So I thought that was a great idea. Did you put that in your presentation for us because we're a trucking company? I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also you can, uh, let's say you're traveling, you can use your own uh, body weight just doing um, exercises like lunges, push-ups, that sort of thing. Even some hotels nowadays, if you ask them, they'll have a, a gym bag, they call it different things, that they will, for no charge, bring to your room and it would have some weights in it and a, a mat and some stretch bands and things like that. So sometimes just ask and you might get a little extra perk there. Okay, let's see here. Alrighty, and then there's also all of our technology nowadays computer and phone, uh, MyFitnessPal, uh, Fitness Class, Nike Training Club, YouTube videos, etc. So there's a lot of things for free and accessible, especially with iPhones. Does anyone use any of these types of um, apps or anything? Wh which one do you use? I use the Nike Run on my iPod Mini. Oh, okay. You like that? Yeah. Great. Okay. Mine is uh, got a calorie counter in the. Uh, no, it's this other one here. I got another one here too. Uh, Live strong. Live strong. Okay. okay. Great. Great. I, I haven't downloaded mine, but somebody said there's a real good one if you're eating out. It just really covers all foods. To tell you. Do you have any recommendations? Let's see here. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there are a lot of those. You're absolutely right. And you always want to get your um, physician's approval before exercising. Okay? All right. Moving on to goal number two, nutrition. Carbohydrate is not a bad thing, and we hear a lot about carbs nowadays. Uh, but for good reason. We've kind of overdone it in the past couple of decades, so we do need to back away from so much of the carbohydrate we've been eating. But um, we do need our carbs for energy. We need some healthy fats, lean proteins, and our water. So we're going to talk about all four of those. All righty. So when it comes to carbohydrate, you can choose um, butter beans or jelly beans, and both are going to give you carbs, but the butter beans are going to be better for you. They're going to digest more slowly, go more slowly into the bloodstream, and um, you're not going to have those uh, effects from eating so much sugar. All right, so simple carbohydrates, we're going to differentiate now between the, the simple carbs and the complex carbs. The simple carbs, no real nutritional value, you know, just empty calories, it's your sugary things. They do cause a spike in blood sugar levels, and they do break down real quickly. So if you are an avid bike rider, you know, you're a runner, they even make the little um, glucose uh, supplement things now. I'm sure the people on Peachtree Road Race this weekend are gonna be using some of those things because they are going to need that energy. They're going to need, because they're gonna burn it right off. Uh, but for mere mortals, you know, you don't need that all the time. An occasional sweet treat is fine, but if you're constantly eating sugary things or drinking a lot of sweet tea, you're messing with your blood sugar levels and you're messing with your pancreas too. So some examples would be candy cake, pie sugar, syrup, sodas, even juice and honey, even though they're from more natural um, sources, if you take in too much of it, it can mess with your blood sugar levels. Um, now then, on the other side of the equation, the complex carbohydrates digest and absorb much more slowly. So you're going to have less spiking of your blood sugar levels. And they're typically going to be high in fiber. You want to look for about three grams of fiber or more per serving. Some examples of those would be um, grains, breads, pasta, oatmeal, brown rice, whole grain cereals, and then starchy vegetables and legumes. I want to focus just a second on that last one, legumes, be beans, peas, and lentils, super healthy. The fibers in the beans help lower cholesterol, and they're about three times as potent in those fibers as oats are, and you know how good oats are for lowering cholesterol. So if you hadn't had any in a while, 
find ways to incorporate more and more beans into your diet, really healthy foods. <laughs> All right. Any questions about the carbohydrates? Okay. All righty. Now for fats, one thing we know nowadays, we don't need to go super low on fats like we used to think years ago. You still want to watch the types of fats that you're eating and you don't want to eat a bunch of greasy fried type foods, but we really want to be a little more moderate with our fat intake and emphasize more of the monounsaturated fats in our diet. And that would be things like olive oil, avocado, nuts and seeds, canola oil. Those are all good sources of monounsaturated fat, okay? So you always want to check your labels if you're eating a packaged food for the amount of fat in it. And we'll talk about how much in a minute. But your saturated fat and your trans fat are the bad guys. Your monounsaturated fat and your polyunsaturated fat are the good guys. The trans fats, based on what we know to date, are pretty much the worst things for us. And you'll get trans fats and a lot of your processed foods, a lot of the bakery goods, Shortening is a great example of where you get a lot of trans fat and stuff made from shortening. You know, periodically, we're going to all have a piece of pie or a biscuit, okay? But you just can't eat that stuff every day and expect to live a healthy lifestyle. It's, it just it doesn't work that way. So if you can save those kinds of foods for just occasional treats, you'll be better off for it. So um, for men, ballpark. About 50 to 60 grams of total fat per day is considered about right, and that's based on about a 2,000 calorie diet per day. I brought some um, fat test tubes for y'all uh, to look at, uh, just just as one way of another way of looking at fat. A lot of fast foods are listed on there, and that is illustrating the amount of fat in the particular food written on the on the little test tube if you extracted it and put it in a test tube it would it would look like that it would be that much and a lot of your fast food meals a lot of your value meals will have 50 to 60 grams of fat just in the one bag so you really shouldn't eat that stuff you shouldn't eat it hardly at all. you shouldn't eat it ever but shouldn't hardly eat it at all and at least nowadays, there's some better options. You know, there really are some healthier choices. Every once in a while, we all want a good burger. We do. But you just can't eat that stuff every day and stay healthy. Just mix it up a little bit. Get a little variety. You know, have a grilled chicken sandwich and, and have a little variety there and avoid the fried foods. But when you actually crack the numbers, it's interesting to see how much fat is in everything. But that is a good ballpark number to go by based on, well, how much total fat should I have in a day? We talked about cutting back on saturated fat and eliminating trans fat. Um, so in terms of percentages, for saturated fat, less than 7% of total calorie intake, and for trans fat, less than 1% of total calorie intake. All righty, for lean proteins, if you're a meat eater, a lot of us are, and that's fine, just choose lean cuts. Chicken, turkey, fish, wild game. Any hunters here? Yep, that's good stuff. Um, I saw a deer this morning, as a matter of fact. Took a little walk, saw a little deer. Um, lean cuts of pork and beef. Also dairy sources, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt. I know y'all are excited about this one. Um, beans, tofu, nuts, seeds, and quinoa. Do y'all know what quinoa is? I put that on there because it happens to have complete protein. We think of it like a grain. <clears throat> Technically, it's a seed. And NASA has done some real uh, interesting research with it, considering <clears throat> utilizing it for space travel food because it's so lightweight. It's healthy stuff. You can get it nowadays in the store. And it's, for me, I think it's a nice alternative to brown rice, which I happen to like, but I get a little sick of everything all the time. So quinoa makes a nice little side dish, cooks up in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, it's, it's just healthy. And again, it has complete protein. So that's kind of a nice little added feature of that particular, um, again, we call it a grain. Technically, it's a seed. But those would be some uh, sources of lean protein, and you'll be getting a handout today 
that lists these and more in your um, green column, the column that says eat more of these lean proteins. All right, how much protein? We're going to uh, do a little math here, bring it down to something practical. In general, adults need 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram. And one of the reasons I'm going to spend a little time on this is, you know, you hear so many different things about protein and, well, and if you lift weights, you need more protein and there's protein bars and there's protein shakes and on and on. So let's look at it a little more specifically. So let's take an average weight for a man, about 185 pounds, just kind of a standard average weight. And in order to get kilograms, you divide by 2.2. So 185 divided by 2.2 is 84.09. So that would be the weight in kilograms. Then you divide that 84.09 times your 0 0.8, and you get 67 grams. So that's a good general number for how much protein. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute. Okay. Um, now, the other um, there's two other ways to look at this. One would be um, if you are an ultra athlete, you know, strength training, you're winning trophies for your athletic abilities, upper, upper end. And it is recommended for um, those athletes 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram. And we do the math. Again, average weight, 185 divided by 2.2, we get 84.09. We multiply the weight in kilograms by the 1.6 and we get 134 grams for 134 grams of protein. I'm, I'm giving you the two numbers here to show you the range because if you start looking at amounts of protein, it's not hard to get the protein that you need. And the thing about it is, and I checked with my colleague who's an exercise physiologist and he said, they keep testing it, and all the research shows that above 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram, your body doesn't use it except for energy. So you need what you need, and you need your protein, but if you're eating excess protein, your body will literally digest it, break it down, use it for energy, and you could have had beans and riceness cheaper, okay? Um, there's a time and a place for, you know, protein shakes and, and all of that, but just be a little wary, especially if some wary, if someone's selling you something, you don't need endless amounts is the point. You eat too much, you're going to actually put a uh, strain on your kidneys, you're going to dehydrate, dehydrate yourself a little bit more, and it's just an expensive way to get energy. So for regular folks who are active and maybe do the two to three days a week, a little strength training, about one gram per kilogram on the protein. You do the math and that's going to work out to about 84 grams of protein. So let me show you what some of these amounts look like with my handy dandy food models here. Um, I just pulled some of these together and calculated the protein amount so that you could see how much protein. I'm going to pass this around and I want, I want you all to um, estimate how much protein you think is represented, represented on that plate. There's a um, little hamburger patty, three slices of pork tenderloin, a little bitty three ounce chicken breast, green peas, red beans, a little bit of almonds, and three ounces of cheddar cheese. Any guesses as to how much protein that is? No bacon. No bacon. We need <laughs> we, yeah, I know, that's right. <laughs> We're beyond breakfast. Carol, it's lunchtime. Carol, tell us how many grams of protein that is. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more. A little bit more. About 35, 40, probably. A little bit more. He said 60. Uh, it's more than that. Well, I was going to say 140. Less than that. Getting closer, getting warmer. Very close. 110. 100. That's 100 grams of protein right there. 
<laughs> Those are almonds. That's just one ounce of almonds. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, you know, what y'all think, but that's not that. That's you know, you could eat that in a day, right? As part of different meals, and then some, and that's a hundred grams right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need this. We're either going to turn you up or not. There's a disclaimer on there that says not to be eaten. That's right. <laughs> don't sue me now. Don't sue me. Um, so, you know, again, all that right there, that's 100 grams of protein. You know, so it's not difficult to get protein that you need, is my point. Alrighty, now, number three, talking about handling stress. And there are physical consequences of it. Increases in abdominal fat, blood sugar. Uh, it decreases the functioning of your immune system, elevates your blood pressure, elevates your heart rate, and then the emotional consequences as listed there, anxiety, irritability, depression, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of reminds me of driving through Atlanta today. Anytime you get on the connector, right? Increases your cortisol levels. Um, but it's significant. It's, it's very significant. We all have it to deal with, and, and yet it's a good reminder to think about um, handling that stress. Alrighty, some tips to reduce stress. Improve time management, stay positive, and seek help. It's something as simple as journaling, uh, therapy, yoga, deep breathing, and just talk stuff out with a buddy. Uh, living a healthy lifestyle like we just talked about, exercising. Exercise literally burns off the um, stress hormones that your body releases. And our bodies are made to have a stress response because, you know, back in the day when a tiger was chasing you, you needed the energy to run away from that tiger. So your body released um, adrenaline and your blood sugar levels went up and, and the cortisol came up and those things allowed your body to respond quickly. But anymore, we tend to have more emotional stress and we don't have many, too many tigers chasing us, so we tend to bottle it up, you know, whether we're angry for whatever reason or sitting in traffic, but exercise literally when you're moving your body, moving your body, those hormone levels leave the bloodstream. They are used up and you don't want those things circula circulating in your bloodstream over time. It is bad for your health. So one of the best things about exercise is it reduces stress. Um, just making sure you get enough sleep. Doesn't have to be eight hours. Seven might be good for you. I know it sounds easier said than done, but you can, if you're well rested, you can get plenty uh, uh, done in the time you have remaining. If you find that you're having trouble sleeping, then talk to your doctor about it. It could be some sleep apnea issues. Um, increasing exercise, losing weight can help. Also, <coughs> um, pay attention and, and take a second look at your caffeine intake. You may be, you know, drinking the same Cokes or things that you've had for years, but as we get older, it affects us differently and we don't tend to tolerate it as much, even iced tea. Um, some iced tea is so, if it's good, it's made strong, uh, but it can disrupt sleep too. So pay attention to uh, your sources of caffeine if you're not getting good sleep. And just take time to play. Do something fun. You know, it's, it's not always easy to take off a week or two on a big vacation, but maybe you can just schedule in some time to go up to the North Georgia mountains and go for a hike or um, take your kids somewhere. It could be something real, real simple. Just go to the park, go look at the ducks on the lake, something simple just to give yourself a little bit of playtime. And we forget that sometimes as grown-ups, just to do some nice little um, fun things for ourselves and for our families. Got a handout on that too, so if you want more information, got that. All right, hydration. I talked to a lot of folks, um, a lot of my patients on the phone, and 
my um, opinion from talking to a lot of men is that y'all don't drink enough water and you need to drink more water and it will um, affect many, many areas of your life, including your, your kidneys, the health of your kidneys, okay? So if you hadn't thought about that in a while, think about it, pay attention to it. You need, you need your water. Um, adequate intake for men is roughly about 10 cups of water a day. That's eight ounce measuring cups. So for a um, 16 ounce uh, bottle, obviously, you know, five of those a day. Um, and That's coffee- Five of those a day? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> What's that? that well, yeah, that, 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 that's estimated. You know, everybody's different, but um, if you're just drinking the equivalent of one of these a day, you need more. And coffee doesn't really count. I mean, you might get a little bit of liquid benefit from it, but it's also a diuretic, so it's pushing water out. So I say you don't count your tea and your coffee. If it's got caffeine in it, you need to just count your actual water, okay? Also, when you're working out, especially in our uh, hot weather here for the summer, you actually need another eight ounces every 15 minutes when you're, when you're exercising. If you're, if you're exercising right and you're sweating, you need to rehydrate, especially um, during the really hot days and you have to be real cautious about heat exhaustion. It can happen to you just like that. You need to have enough water before you go out and do whatever you're doing activity-wise, have plenty of water with you, and drink it throughout the activity, whether it's, you know, tennis or whatever you're doing out there. So be sure to keep yourself hydrated. You don't want to pass out in the heat. Also, if you're doing, say if you're running, um, anybody a runner? Anybody running Peachtree? Oh, cool. Um, he even runs to work. <laughs> so you probably know about this. Um, once you've finished your race, your activity, um, you need to replace every pound lost with a pound of water, with 16 ounces of water. Because when, you, when you've lost weight directly after an athletic event, it is water, and you need to replace that. So um, athletes, whether they're you know, high school, college, Olympic, whatever, they know this rule, and they, will, they, they abide by it, because you can get real sick if you don't. So those are some very important rules about your hydration. Okay, any questions about that? All righty, and some reasons why about 70 to 80% of your brain tissue is water, and if you're dehydrated, your body and your mind are stressed. Helps to prevent muscle cramping and lubricates the joints in the body. And when you're well hydrated, you really can exercise longer and you don't hit the wall so much. Very important, again, in the hot weather, I can't emphasize it enough. Um, proper hydration reduces constipation, reduces headaches, reduces kidney stones. And if you're starting to feel thirsty, you're probably already a bit hydrated. You want to just, you need to keep water at your side all the time, all day long and just drink that water, sip on that water, drink that water. If you're, again, you don't want to get to the point where you're, ooh, boy, I'm thirsty, that's dehydration, okay. All right, I wanted to put this up here. I need some water now. A list of diseases and conditions associated with obesity because I, I again, I see this all the time and I see the, the relationship and I want everybody to, um, to see what all is involved here. Um, and so many of the things we just talked about are related to obesity. Many of the things that our laboratory uh, tests for are, you know, some of these things here on the list. So they are things I'm talking to patients about. DVT is deep uh, vein thrombosis, so that would be, say, blood clots in the uh, legs, they can go to the lungs, that sort of thing. If you uh, do any sitting for long periods of time, you need to get up and move around. People who travel a lot for their work, they need to wear, you know, support socks, they need to get up and walk around on the airplane. And this is, this is a limited list. The list goes on and on, but there's a lot of stuff that's related to what has become our common American diet and our lack of exercise. And you know, back in the day, 
you had to build your own house, you had to um, you know, grow your own food, and we don't have to do that anymore. So you have to make a special effort to make good food choices and to stay active um, so that you can avoid this stuff. This stuff is not fun, it can be very costly, and it will take you out of work and put you up in a hospital bed somewhere. So better to take the time on the front end preventing it, right? Okay, so in order to accomplish some of these things, where do you begin? Well, just get your mind on it and make some reasonable goals. You might jot them down. You might put sticky notes on your bathroom mirror. Um, but be realistic about it and make smart goals. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and relevant and timely. And just try to, you know, do one thing at a time. Maybe I'm going to drink more water this week. I'm going to drink one more bottle of water every day this week. That's my goal. And then maybe the next week, all right, I'm going to get to bed 30 minutes earlier. Every night this week, make them, make it, um, make them doable so that they can become incorporated healthy habits. Okay, and just remember that you're always in control of your health.